All right, guys. Super excited to host today's show because uh, today I have a special guest, uh, Alexander Anker, as uh, the guest on the Ravid show, and we'll be. He's the co-founder and partner and ML director at Neuron Labs. Uh, we'll today we'll be discussing about his journey, about science, machine learning, finance, machine learning, and uh, business applications in machine learning. It will be fun. I can't wait to have him. Uh, today on board and also uh, for the people who are joining in just a quick uh, shout out to ODAC Europe the show is sponsored by ODAC Europe today and uh, you guys have a chance to win through two premium passes from ODAC so uh, more luck uh, more uh, wishes to ODAC also let's uh, without any further ado let's have uh, Alex here okay Alex Oh, oh my hello, God. hello. <laughs> Alex, oh, who is this? Who is this? Huh? Trump? <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, oh it's goodness. actually just me. <laughs> oh, 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 hey, so cool. Uh, that was face mask which you had put. I was just wondering that uh, am I interviewing Trump? <laughs> but uh, this well, is fun. Maybe Trump is using my mask now. You'll never know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. But uh, anyways, uh, I was just uh, letting folks know that uh, you were, you visited ODSC as well, right? Uh, you did a workshop at ODSC Europe. Can you tell yeah. us a little about that? Yeah, it was actually just a couple of hours ago. It was about uh, reinforcement learning in finance. And basically, I was uh, given the introduction to the topic and I showed how applying these algorithms in finance is really different from the mainstream applications like for video games or to play chess because uh, wow. the world of games and the world of finance is completely different. And that was... Wow. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll definitely talk a, a little about more in detail going through the show. But uh, for the audience, uh, uh, Alex, people would love to know about your background, where you're coming from and what do you do. So can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. I'm Alex uh, Honchar, geographically coming from Kiev, Ukraine. Last uh, six years uh, living in Italy, Verona. Professionally, my background uh, as a teenager started like as many, maybe many, many of you guys like uh, doing some websites, trying to do video games. But eventually, life took me to study mathematics. And uh, as an application of mathematics university, I found machine learning. So I had the uh, relatively interesting, not relatively, it was interesting career as an independent AI specialist uh, where I could uh, help uh, different startups and my specifications like specialties or machine learning in healthcare and machine learning in finance. Uh, when I was, when I became more or less proficient in machine learning, I started to teach a bit. I was giving uh, talks on the conferences in a couple of universities. And for the last couple of years, uh, I'm a co-founder and uh, machine learning director at Neurons Lab. Uh, and uh, we are also doing machine learning, but uh, for the environment and for the people. So basically we work in the industrial IoT. So we help to reduce emissions, to make uh, operations more efficient. And we work in healthcare. We help uh, operations and uh, research uh, for, for our lives for health. Awesome. That is a uh, you know, great uh, introduction about yourself. And, and now we know about Neural Labs and you being the co-founder at Neuron Labs. Can you tell us more about uh, what you guys do at Neuron Labs? Is it uh, because I have seen you working in different domains, maybe chemical, maybe finance or healthcare, you everywhere, you kind of capitalize on machine learning and do different things around. So can you just let us know about uh, more about you and Neuron uh, Labs? What, what do you guys do? Yeah, of course. They're saying there is like a two sides of the story. One is uh, basically what is our work, what we do for the clients. And you're right. We started as a company that was doing kind of everything around machine learning, but we quickly realized that we need to focus on something because there are so many competitors that are good engineers and they're ready to do kind of any kind of task. And we need to yeah. find what will be our specialty, what will be the thing that we can capitalize over and be unique. And yeah. uh, currently what we found is uh, like a triplet of three things. One, of course, is machine learning. That's what uh, we are born from. Second is the two domains. As I said, it's like healthcare, industrial IT. So we accumulate the product expertise, the domain expertise. We understand uh, what companies in this business work, what are the metrics. Uh, but the third, and I think this is kind of like the secret sauce, which is not secret anymore, is the science. We focus on the tasks that require knowledge of some uh, 
of not trivial knowledge. For example, like uh, to do drug discovery, you need to understand chemistry really well. And not every data scientist knows chemistry. Or for example, yeah. to work, uh, to analyze like the diesel engines, it's not enough just to be like computer vision engineer. You need to understand physics and understand physics really well. So this is yeah. like the knowledge of the physics. So we capitalize over a triplet of machine learning, uh, product knowledge, and the scientific knowledge. And uh, yeah, from the sciences, it's uh, physics, chemistry, and the last one is economics, finance. Wow, I think that is kind of you kind of covering the 360 degree of, uh, you know, obviously the healthcare system, the chemical and the finance, which are the most booming topics today. So uh, do you also uh, work in algo trading by any chance? Do you guys cater that industry as well? Yeah, yeah, this is actually a background of my and uh, my partner Igor is coming from, uh, from the okay. financing region. Uh, the thing is that uh, we are a consulting company, Student Slab, and uh, it's uh, relatively hard to build a consulting business around trading, around finance, because this industry is uh, relatively closed and uh, most of the managers and the owners, they tend to have their own departments. For them, it's much more safe to invest a lot of money in their own research department than to ask consultants to help but some of them they still ask for it maybe not very publicly but they still need some help uh, that's why we have our own piece of cake as well okay that's amazing so which are the three domain if you if i ask you the three top domain that your company caters to which are these three domains and uh what's the type of uh, you know the partnership that you guys have with them yeah uh, domains are healthcare, industrial IT, and uh, finance. Uh, the typical partnerships are we help our customers, our clients with the AI product development, the core. So usually our customers, they're really strong product builders. They understand the market. They are on the frontier of the needs, but uh, they might be a bit behind from the technology perspective, because especially it's hard to find people who know like machine learning, science, and the product. And this is our job to find, unite these people and uh, that's where we help them. So typically we work as uh, as product development partners. That's the typical relationship we have. Okay, that sounds good. Also, uh, I wanted to uh, know a little about uh, obviously the finance industry. Me being a finance background person, I always, I'm always intrigued to learn more about finance. Uh, wanted to understand that, uh, how can you tell us more about uh, the finance for machine learning how is it growing and what's actually changing because typically back then it was very traditional if we talk about uh, you know even trading it used to be you know pick up the phone and uh, just go and uh, give a call to the stock broker and you know you book a, a, a stock altogether but in today's uh, world it is kind of completely changed where it's just not limited to uh, you know just going and buying stocks rather, rather you can actually capitalize it on machine learning and you can use machine learning in the right way and trade so yeah i would love to know more about it yeah i think to have kind of like the really big picture perspective you need to go a couple of hundred years before when the finance was just emerging so basically yeah. uh, the first companies that there, there were a lot of different trades right but uh, for example the investing started like uh, two three hundred years ago and back then it was really straightforward there was an expedition to to asia to middle east to buy some goods to sell them some goods and you could invest in it you can participate in the yeah. ship into this campaign and uh, when the sh if the ship is coming back you could get a return the investment with the goods selling the goods and uh, back then investments were really straightforward you could just analyze the captain analyze the company analyze the goods and uh, it was really simple and linear decision making uh, it was was a couple of hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, the, especially in the United States, in England, in Europe, the more faster market emerged, especially with the telegraph, with the phones. As, as you mentioned, uh, the news started to spread much more faster. And decision making became uh, also faster. It became non-linear and it uh, became, uh, I would say, not always so straightforward. Uh, so basically, there were started became more and more market manipulations, like news manipulations, media manipulations. And uh, for example, the company that performs well, it doesn't mean that the stock will go up. And in order to answer the question why, you might look into some other hidden factors. So the decision making yeah. was started become more and more not obvious, more and more kind of hierarchical, not linear. And uh, it was 100 years ago. And now in the internet, it's crazy. 
there are millions of people doing the trades. They have their own minds, their own decision making, and uh, it's not always rational. For example, like recently we see these meme stocks, they're booming like to the moon, skyrocketing. Yeah. And uh, uh, in order to understand it, it's not enough just to apply some simple economical re reasoning. And actually, that's answer to the question: Why machine learning is becoming so popular? Because uh, what we had uh, 20, 50, 100 years ago, it was a classic economical models. They're becoming obsolete. They're becoming irrelevant in the world. The world is changing too much. And the machine learning is a technology. This is something what is actually is designed to be adaptive. It's designed to take the recent data, uh, okay. find the patterns in the data. And uh, if there is no pattern in the data, to find the new patterns. So that's why this is extremely relevant today. And uh, people are applying it more and more. Yeah, I think that definitely makes sense. It's more about uh, how operationalized the uh, the whole game has been today. It has completely changed the face of uh, definitely the machine learning and also the trading. Uh, and there are many more applications. So uh, how do you, you know, how do you actually, my question is how do you actually play around when, you know, now you are in the finance domain, but tomorrow you're catering uh, healthcare, or maybe at the same time you are uh, catering the healthcare domain as well. So how challenging it is first thing for you to shift that, or is it on the same base that you have created, you can cater to different domains? Uh, the answer is twofold. So basically to work in different domains, of course, I have partners who help me with it. And uh, I'm not doing everything by myself. And I have great partners who understand very well healthcare, who understand physics, who understand IoT. And uh, my work shifted a bit more to be on the fundamental principles. So uh, of course, the finance domain is something what I understand well personally. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, for example, to grow the company, I need to develop the practices, I need to develop the kind of like the key rules, key principles uh, to deliver the result. And uh, these key rules, they're actually, they're actually universal. Uh, the way how do you how you collect the data and treat the data, the way you structure your modeling experimenting process, the, the way you prepare the results to the client. So the client, especially the product managers, they need to understand really well and really clearly what will be the value. And uh, kind of the underlying principles, this, 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 the underlying principles of the data collection organizations, like structuring the knowledge, the universal things, the yeah. modeling, mathematical modeling, because machine learning, what it is, it's basically mathematical modeling. There are universal right. laws that we know like for a couple of hundreds of years. Mathematical modeling is still mathematical modeling. There are laws and principles we still can apply in any domain. And product management is relatively a new thing, but also there are principles, they are metrics, uh, there are this kind of reports. There is uh, like a market, uh, like like the way how do you connect to the market, get the feedback from the market, it's universal. So on yeah. one level, you can develop the universal laws and uh, a bit lower level, there are experts, there are great people who support this. Awesome. I think that is uh, like a teamwork that you are into. Of course. It, the teamwork kind of helps very well. So there was a question uh, here from Aditi Kinvasra. Uh, how do you see machine learning used in healthcare industry nowadays? Uh, I would start kind of from the top bottom approach. Uh, basically, okay. uh, what uh, what are the, the main pro one of the main problems in the healthcare is the especially in the United States because that's where it kind of was on the frontier and everyone's talking about this. It's uh, very expensive, first of all, mm -hmm. and being expensive, it's also been very slow. And uh, why it is so? Because before there were a lot of investments, there are a lot of people. That's kind of a really big running machine and the people processes are really inefficient. And we see this, this expensiveness, this price and this uh, low speed almost in every function. Uh, we can now we go again from the top to the bottom. You go, for example, you enter to the hospital and you have the insurance. And for example, you need to do right. some some minor surgery. You have the insurance. What you need to and you were in the car accident. You need to collect all the documents uh, from the police about your car accidents. You need to do all the scans. You need to yeah. buy some prescriptions. They maybe you need to do the surgery, and uh, you collect all those documents. And then someone has to analyze them. This is not really related to the kind of to the health, but this is the part of the process that is really slow because there is some person who is actually reading all your PDFs, 
or the worst case, the paper, reading your papers and trying to analyze if your claim is correct. This can be done automatically. It's like it should be like a one second work. You upload your PDFs and it's scored automatically. It's much more faster and, and it's much less expensive. And this is only one example of kind of routine that even happens before the actual healthcare. When we are going to, for example, a bit more complex task there and we need new drugs the COVID show us that we really need to speed up the process of the drug of the medicine development right because uh, uh, the vaccine we could develop relatively fast but all the other drugs they've been developed like in uh, five ten years and if you look only on this process there's also so many inefficiencies for example uh, you have some idea for the drug even not going to the chemistry and you need to collect people who are actually uh, will be will be test this drug and uh, what the problem here for example you uh, need to find people and by the classical books the uh, kind of like uh, the requirements for these people are very strict and uh, their recent research for example Andres and Horowitz they talk about this they have a podcast and actually they highlight in the research it shows that you don't need such strict rules you don't need to wait for months to organize a clinical trial. You can do it uh, much more faster because machine learning shows where you can relax those rules and find people much faster and do the trials better. And basically it's like, uh, uh, if you go on the top down, it's too expensive and too long. And this priciness and this slow process is it really, it's really everywhere. So that's where the room for improvement is huge. You pick any place, any function, and you see there are people, too many people, who are doing the job too long. Unfortunately, it reduces down to this. Yeah, I think that definitely makes sense and answers all of these questions. Also, I, I had a curiosity about, uh, obviously, uh, about algo trading, uh, since I asked you about it. Uh, I wanted to know more about uh, algo trading, how is actually, uh, you know, it is being used in, like, me being a trader, if, if I feel like, uh, going out and doing an algo trade and how does uh, neuron lab kind of helps a trader to go out and do some trading with the help of machine learning do you guys set up from start to end there's a platform that you would set up or how does it work yeah of course basically uh, what we work our approach is uh, because people often see things like uh, algo trading is kind of like a magical button it's like yeah. you just need to apply some algorithm and it will make you a lot of money unfortunately especially in this domain what we really work on we set up a process when i say it like uh, there, there are rules and laws of the process of scientific discovery of mathematical modeling and this is what can be applied really well in algorithmic trading what we start with is we define what is the investor profile and mm -hmm. uh, there are people who are more risky less risky the people with their own preferences and it has to be uh, described as the metrics because all the algo trading is done for someone for the investor investors yeah. they might have different goals uh, when we analyze this, we can understand what are the interesting market markets, what are the strategy classes that may work for this kind of person. And then we start basically the, the funeral of the scientific discovery. We have some ideas, we have some hypotheses. We connect to the real world environment. It can be just the market, it can be exchange, it can be alternative data. We connect to the data sources, we collect them. Then we try to find some alpha there, if there is something, uh, some predictive value in this process. Mm -hmm. If we found this predictive value, we can build a strategy. So basically this is the part when we kind of build the economic theory. For example, we found out uh, some rules based on the volatility or some rules based on the news. We build it as a small economic theory with the trading rules and then we backtest it. On the backtesting stage, we test for a lot of different risks. We simulate uh, different scenarios and we come up basically with a statement, a report which shows uh, kind of like uh, covers all the potential risks that the strategy can appear, what can happen, what is the kind of like worst and best expected performance. And right. then uh, if uh, investor, if the team is happy, we connect it to the back to the environment and we start the circle. So basically then the strategy is trading. Of course, uh, this is the work doesn't end because every strategy it has uh, as the product as a company they have their own life cycle yeah. the strategy is uh, hypothesized researched developed executed and in the in the end it's decommissioned it's important to understand when you need to close the strategy 
and uh, because uh, simply this inefficiency of the market is already exploited by everyone else and this is kind of continuous process and this is what we mainly work with uh, with our clients we set up this process mm -hmm. and when the process is set up then it's uh, everything is already much 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 more easier oh my god there's so much that goes into just a setup uh, there's so much of research there's so much of foundational work that you guys get yeah. into for the client and uh, definitely it makes a lot of sense thanks for answering that uh, and also we had an interesting question in the um, comment section here uh, since we are talking about uh, finance uh, uh, from Mavi Kinvasa, how is finance intersecting with the uh, machine learning? So he's asking at a whole, how does how do you see finance actually intersecting with machine learning? Uh, again, kind of, kind of top top bottom approach. Uh, the yeah, finance exactly. is uh, the field about the numbers. It's it's clear that's the it's the numbers game, and yeah. uh, it it's used to work with the numbers kind of with classical econometric models. So there are scientists who are researching data from the past. They try to find some patterns with their own eyes, with their own knowledge, and they tell us some new kind of financial series, which we can apply to maybe to trade, maybe to evaluate some companies, maybe to structure the debts, whatever financial company is working on. Uh, where machine learning is coming in play is to develop, uh, help to develop this series adaptively data-driven and focusing on the out-of-sample performance because the researchers, they focus on the past data to explain what was happening in the past and usually they forget to tell what's going to happen in the future, at least to make some mm -hmm. estimates or to ensure the robustness of the models. And this is what machine learning is primarily designed to do. Machine learning is always like a train set, test set. Mm -hmm. It's designed to perform well in the future. So this wow. is uh, where it's kind of like penetrating the field. Awesome. I think that... Uh really sounds very well and answers uh, Marvin's question. Uh, also, uh, I had one interesting question for you where uh, can you show us a demo of your platform uh, where uh, on your website, like how does Neuron Labs work and uh, if we want to actually get into it, uh, can you show us? That yeah, yeah, is? of course. Let me awesome. let me share my screen. Sure. A moment, please. Where it is, where it is. Uh, for example, uh, I hope you guys can see it. Yeah, we can now. This is amazing. Yeah, this is uh, like a simple example of uh, what could be the final result of some analytical solution. Imagine mm -hmm. uh, a power plant or a power station and uh, the station has some aggregates, some devices. And uh, there are hundreds of them and they all might break and if something breaks, for example, the energy production is stopped. And uh, when you find a problem, you can basically lose a lot of money, a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the solutions we develop for our clients is the predictive maintenance. So basically you can see there is like uh, different sensors. Okay. And we can analyze each sensor, how it, uh, what is kind of like the normal performance and what is right. the deviation of the sensors from the normal performance. For example, this is, uh, let's say, deviating kind of a lot. This is like the top one. And uh, when we have analysis of each sensor separately, we can build the big picture and we can yeah. see if the system is behaving uh, normally, if you need to basically look at this or something might break. So this is the, the red is the risk zone. And we can also yeah. interpret it. So basically see we there are some events and we connect these events to, the, uh, to some actional advices wow. for example you can see that the oil pressure increased you should go and yeah. adjust the value so this is a tool that uh, in real time analyzes the data from the iot sensors and basically giving advices to the maintenance engineers before some breakdown happens so this is basically the whole idea of predictive maintenance to monitor in real time what is happening estimate the risks for the future and basically give uh, actionable advices to the maintenance people uh what to do next yeah wow this is uh like one of the examples yeah i think this uh, looks very good so in this predictive modeling do you guys have uh uh something that you can set if there's a, a deviation goes super high so does it prompt the the dashboard gives you a prompt out to the client that uh, it's going a little higher than what we are expecting something like that 
Yeah, of course, it's a, it's been re-ranked here. So basically, we can see okay. this. You see, it's been updated automatically. What uh, what is yeah. the influence? What is the threshold? And uh, basically, these events are also being sent via uh, to a messenger to the responsible people. So actually, the dashboard is running kind of like on the background. But these yeah. notifications, this is what's, what's what's the most important thing. These notifications, uh, you can, for example, like uh, set up. They're being sent as a in a messenger or in the, as the SMS. So actually, this is kind of like the the core final result, the events and their interpretation. Okay, that sounds good. Do you have any more examples, Mohammed? It looks like uh, as the demo. This is the only demo that is kind of up now. Uh, yeah, I can show you basically on our website. Let yeah. me let me show you the another another tab. Sure. That would be nice. For example, there are a couple of interesting cases on our website. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, this is the project where you actually need to understand the chemistry really well. Koja, this wow. is a skincare startup, and mm -hmm. uh, they need to create basically the serums, the, com the chemical compound in the laboratory mm -hmm. that's personalized for your skin. And uh, in order to create a personalized skincare for you, you need to basically take everyday selfies, you need to fill on your questionnaires. And based on your skin condition, we can create a skin treatment personalized for you. And we help with the machine learning here. Another case can be precision medicine developments. For example, for the hospitals, as I mentioned, they organize clinical trials. And yeah. uh, you can uh, basically take kind of rules for the drug dosage, but uh, it's not working for everyone because, again, this is kind of like developed by some scientists in the past based on the small amount of data. Today, we have a lot of data and we can build yeah. from that like real predictive models and uh, we can make like personalized drug dosages. There are like interesting cases with the genetics research. Uh, we didn't do the scientific part here, but but we helped with the data platform because the terabytes of the data, database of genome genomes is huge, and you need to organize mm -hmm. it as a platform. And then the scientists are making queries to the different parts of genomes for different people to make their own studies. And uh, even organizing the data for them, it's already a lot of value. This is a company from Singapore. We the, we help them with predictive maintenance for the ship. For the ship vessels and uh, in the renewables you worked on the smart grid control basically there's like a case uh, when you generate the solar energy you need to store it and the st storing is expensive basically when you generate energy you need to be able or to use it optimally as soon as possible because if you just yeah. generate it and store it it might be even not get used so we need to build the prediction models for the usage and this way we can generate exactly how we need and we don't waste uh, resources and yeah and actually this is the case from the finance we helped this one with uh, uh, developing uh, using alternative data in cryptocurrency uh, yeah. world to build portfolios this is a couple of couple of interesting examples i think yeah definitely it does make sense and also i had a question for you uh... Uh, Alex, uh, since you know that uh, obviously you've showed us some uh, great examples, but uh, also AI is helping, uh, you know, a lot in drug formulation and also chemical compounds. So can you throw some light on that as well? How does it work and how is AI applied uh, in these domains? Yeah, sure. Uh, basically, when you do, I'll try to be kind of like this, the simple picture of yeah. what's going on. Okay. Uh, basically, there is a kind of long process of developing a drug. Uh, you have some target, some target disease uh, that is appearing and is somehow represented in our bodies. It can be on the chemical level, on the physical level, uh, even on the DNA level. So there is, it's like there is, you can you can find the disease marker on different levels. And what usually researchers are doing, they're trying to find such a chemical comp compound that can uh, go into your body connect to this part that is related to the disease and eliminate it or to connect to some parts in your body like the vaccine to teach your body to fight some disease yeah. so it's like exactly. to make different uh, connections or with the disease or with your body and usually this is the long long process because you need to theorize about it you need to kind of think which compounds might react uh, you then you might need to do some initial experiments uh, uh, in the laboratory then you need to do tests 
maybe on the animals or maybe on some dead tissue or something like this then if everything's okay you might ask some first people to try on this then you might yeah. clinical trials and maybe in five ten years you finally have your, your pill and you're making your billion of dollars but this is a super long process and uh, actually this process can be reduced from uh, like from from many years maybe to up to one year uh, because mm -hmm. a lot of things are done so-called in vitro which is kind of work in vitro is called like with the living materials with the living cells with the living tissues etc but uh, since we collect we have already collected a lot of data from the past experiments we can now make experiments not in the real life but actually synthesized in the computer so having the data from the past clinical trials from the past the drugs that worked and didn't work if you can use machine learning when you have a new task we already can be able to predict which compounds may or not may react so we reduce the research phase of the first years this happened in the thinking we do first experiments with the dead tissues to the computer simulation which immediately gives us the candidates of the compounds we're ready to test further and this reduces the timing a lot so basically this is like uh, uh, the main is to move uh, from the complex lab experiments in vitro to in silico experiments wow I think in silico true. from the silicon like silicon uh, like basically yeah in the processor yeah. on the computer but i think definitely that is a huge process it doesn't uh, sound that easy as you are saying it's a long long process that goes in so yeah and uh, also Mohammed here had a question from youtube uh, uh, what type of data can you get from the camera regarding the skin since different camera gives different quality results that's a very interesting question yeah of course basically this is uh, a bit more technical question of course there are different yeah. cameras but uh, you can solve this problem kind of on the two sides first one mm -hmm. and this is why it's important for data science team to be uh, have knowledge in the product development uh, yes it's a good technical problem but also you can ask the customer to take a good selfie it's like if the customer oh, okay. is taking selfie in the in the dark room uh, it's obvious that you're going to have a good result and you can think wow how can i make my machine learning model better to work in the dark room why you just right. go to the product manager and say let's use the light sensor in the mobile phone to see what is the light in the room and if it's the dark light simply don't allow to take a selfie oh wow. and yeah. this way you already ensure at least the lightness and there are many such little things that you can do even without machine learning you can just mm -hmm. uh, design your product in such a way that the selfies are ready from more or less the same quality and more or less the same kind of range uh and then basically yeah then there's machine learning process if uh, something doesn't work well you can augment the data uh, you can work on the regularization you can uh, uh, set up a process to collect more different data uh, so basically there are like two sides there is the product development part and of course there is the data science part awesome i think that sounds good so to apply the basic logic maybe here would be obviously to get the product right and get that uh, obviously the lighting's right if that's for a skin type and uh, get the best photo to convert into some good data set so yeah definitely that makes sense also um i had an interesting question for you alex uh, it was uh, around your neural lab so obviously i know neural labs is working towards the healthcare system so how do you guys uh, support the healthcare system did you uh, somewhere also have a project around covid by any chance uh unfortunately we couldn't make a real world project with the COVID, and okay. uh, we felt it's like uh, because also it was really risky because uh, uh oh. we didn't yeah. want to be wrong on the on a hype wave in a way because there are many people who started to do machine learning exactly for COVID. we had the research uh we thought about it but realized that the uh, uh, the risk of making the wrong solution and not long-term solution is simply too high yeah so that's why we basically focused on the things that uh, we do well for example like we know well like biosignal analysis and we have one project now that is uh, uh, for the people who have uh, some addictions and uh, we can help them to basically analyze their health to see when they are at risk 
uh, we have like this project with the skincare when we work kind of like on the yeah. skin analysis in the healthcare. So basically, the way we support healthcare is through our clients. We we don't really have uh, yet like a systematic vision how we're gonna change the healthcare. So we do our small yeah. job in helping the clients who have this vision, but uh, they need yeah. our technological help. That's yeah. what we do. I think. I think those small dots kind of help where you are helping the obviously the big giants, uh, the, the healthcare giants and obviously then it is kind of being a good win-win for everyone out there and definitely it's good that uh, you mentioned about you know there are many solutions, there are many clients who, are, who kind of work on machine learning and the COVID data set and all of those things but didn't do that well. So it is kind of obviously very important to uh, have the right solution or ha have the right data and then maybe start working on it. Uh, so it does make a lot of sense to me. Uh, also, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, Alex, you are also an educator. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask what is the, you know, the greatest challenge of being an educator and uh, what's the difference between obviously owning a company, like being a co-founder of a company and uh, uh, you know, uh, run a company basically. So what's the difference? Uh, what's the yeah. biggest challenge of being an educator? And what's the difference between the company mode and then being that educator mode? Yeah, uh, to me, both of these activities, to me, education is a bit more of a hobby, to be honest. But both wow. of these activities, to me, kind of have, uh, in a way, the same challenge. I treat both the companies for this Neurons Lab and the students who visit my lectures or to go to my courses as my clients. Yeah. So basically, I have perspective that uh, they, even if they attend like some lecture for free, they use my product. So basically, uh, the challenge is uh, is to make the customers happy. And uh, basically, kind of from this point of view, uh, everything starts with this. It's like whatever I do, what even uh, it's like I find a client for a neuron slab and they need addition to the product to have a better service. Uh, it's they are the clients and they have their own clients and the client success is the key. Whenever someone is coming to my lecture, I am really transparent what they're going to learn usually. And uh, so basically my job is to to do what I promised and to leave them, for example, like when we are in your stop and we work with the customers, we don't just, you know, code something. We leave them with the product feature. This is important. So uh, they they get the result. And awesome. uh, with, with the results, which is basically represented as a software that is working, as a documentation, as a process set up around it, so they can actually basically be autonomous with this AI feature we develop. And the same with the students. If someone's coming to my lecture, I don't want to leave this person with like uh, just like okay, they listen something and forgot it. They need to receive the slides, they need to receive the code. If it's university course, they need to do the exercises, and they need to stay with the artifacts of the education first of all. So they can always refer back to this and they need to have the practice with it uh, especially university i usually do like the checkups i give exercises so the students they need to live with the result of knowing how to do something and actually doing this and having the materials to to reuse them so right. i think the chat and the challenge is the, the customer success is it a student is it a company the success of these people this is the biggest challenge and everything is around this <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, I think uh, definitely for an educator, I had Brandon Foles on my show as well, and he mentioned the same thing. He's a YouTuber and an educator in statistics, and he felt that uh, even uh, if there is one person who would just come back and say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that you've done a great job and uh, it kind of helped me. So that is like a win-win. And for an educator, that's the biggest thing. Also, there is a question uh, from Mohammed here. He's, he's asking, do you have an online course already? Uh, not yet, not yet, because uh, I am I have maybe too high quality standards. I have a couple of ideas, but uh, yeah. for example, uh, also I have uh, I spent a couple of minutes at this. I think that uh, basically what can, should be the result of the online course, like a, like a real, real impactful result. You should be able to change your career. For example, if you take a course on, for example, you are a junior data scientist and you take a computer vision course, what should be the real final result? You should get a promotion or you should get a no, new job or you should start a wow. computer vision startup. This is the real result of education, not just like, oh, I study at the neural network. And <laughs> uh, to prepare and for example, the result I personally like and what I'm a big fan of, I'm a big fan of the people who make independent careers. So the, it's uh, 
in a way it's easy just to just to get a job just to pass the interview just to answer the questions you learned uh, <laughs> learn by heart and then yeah. basically you just do what is being told i think they're really interesting insightful and uh, pleasant career is you as the kind of independent creator independent artist or independent engineer you because that's how i worked and i loved it it's like uh, i was the one who is coming to my clients and giving the result first by myself now with the company and uh why I don't have a course yet, because I'm still looking how to build a process and a program to teach people to become such independent experts. To me, it's not really interesting to teach people how to pass the interview. There are a lot of courses for that, a lot of courses when they, they, they teach you how to answer the questions correctly. But to me, this is uh, the competition is too high there. I, I want to build a course for a bit another goal, and I'm still working wow. on it. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think that is kind of a, it resonates with me very well, uh, where if I am taking a course, I would want it to, you know, upskill myself, upskill my upskill myself and my career wise as well. And Kate, here, uh, she mentions the same thing. Yes, online course uh, results should have transformative uh, result. Uh, and uh, that is very important because I took a course by Kate herself uh, on data mm. Kate, it's storytelling and it was fantastic because it kind of helped me in my career where I could actually you know go out and uh, uh, you know tell stories very well can put out those points which were uh, important very well so I think it is uh, important where you can use it daily on uh, you know in your day-to-day -day life and in your job so I, I think definitely that does make a lot of sense thanks for that Alex and also there was an interesting question from Paul Vikash um, uh, your thoughts on ML growing in developing countries compared to developed countries? Yeah, uh, since I am myself coming from a country that is uh, somewhere in the, in between, Ukraine, I think is somewhere in the middle, uh, more as a developing country yet. And uh, basically, I see the difference between like Western European United States and the developing countries. Uh, the countries that are on the top, they generate ideas. They mm -hmm. are on the frontier, the societies, their businesses, they're on the frontier of the world. They, they basically show the direction. Uh, countries that are still developing, uh, they, people from there they also have a lot of ideas, but uh, yeah. unfortunately, the reality is this, when you're in the society that is, uh, where is more problems, uh, and when, when there are more problems, you don't think about how to change the world. You think about how to feed your family, you think about other things. And that's right. why people from wealthy societies, they generate ideas and show the direction and the societies and developing countries they have to follow and be more like executors and this is the reality of course in developing countries a lot of startups a lot of good ideas they become global sometimes but the statistics have shown us when the society is thinking about like how to survive how to feed your family how to feel comfortable yourself uh, you don't think how to change the world you think about how to how to how to, about yourself your family but uh, when uh, your family is happy your society is happy you start to think uh, what's next what's the big future for the for the country for the world and i think this is kind of the main difference and it affects the technologies as well the way yeah. people treat treat the science some people they kind of generate new directions new ideas that generate the frontier and some people follow implement and that's okay that's how that's how the world works <laughs> yeah i think that definitely is how the world works and makes a lot of sense also uh alex i had a question for you since we're talking about world and since we're talking about gathering about people i want i had this interesting question do you visit uh, conferences i know you speak at conferences so that's why you spoke at odsc europe conference this year and how often i often do you visit uh, conferences or speak at conferences and do you find them valuable uh yeah to me actually like uh, speaking about something it's a great way i think there are like uh, two main goals one is it helps me to structure my knowledge so in this way i can uh, i understand things better myself and i can yeah. pass them as a practices as some materials to my colleagues to my students so this is basically uh understanding better and preparing something which can be shared with the others also for for some projects for example and second okay. is networking i meet uh, great people on the conferences with some of them i work later some of them yeah. become students clients uh, colleagues partners so uh i like it and uh, i do i usually like for the last uh, maybe four or five years at least uh, couple of times per year I uh, speak at some conferences and visit conferences wow. and uh, uh, I think five six seven eight times per year something like this yeah 
Awesome. And also your topic at ODSC uh, today was about reinforcement learning in finance. So can you tell us more about it? Uh, since we, in the start of the show, you mentioned about it. Yeah. I would love to know more about reinforcement learning in finance. How does it work? Yeah, yeah, of course. Basically, the whole idea of reinforcement learning is that uh, compared to the supervised learning or supervised learning, when yeah. you have like a like standard machine learning, you have a data set and you try to find some uh, conditional conditional pattern and patterns in it. And uh, for example, in terms of finance, it can be okay. You have a data, you might try to understand which company will grow and which one. Reinforcement yeah. learning has a bit different philosophy. Instead of uh, instead of focusing on the data set and what is kind of correct, not correct there, you focus mm -hmm. on the real world environment and you learned a policy of interacting with the environment to achieve long-term rewards. So this yeah. is like, uh, this is the difference in the philosophy. And uh, I think uh, you and guys who are watching, listening, they saw many examples like uh, reinforcement learning, playing chess, playing Go, playing poker, playing Atari games, playing computer games, playing Doom, doing all wow. the possible things. And uh, my workshop was about that despite all this cool stuff like playing video games, for example, like we teach reinforcement learning to play FIFA or to play Doom. Uh, the learning how to play a game algorithmically, it's really different how to learn how to play the financial market. And right. uh, because uh, the game is relatively close to uh, predictable world. If there is an enemy, you shoot the enemy, it's kind of clear that that's a good. If you go collect the coin in the game, it's like a good. If you fall and die in the game, it's like bad. But in finance, it's much higher. For example, you invest in a company, you yeah. don't have such immediate reward like you did a good thing or a bad thing. Or for example, you followed some signal from the news and you don't have such immediate reward if it was a good or bad decision. And that's why reinforcement learning in finance requires different pipeline, different metrics, different process. And my right. workshop was about uh, like introducing reinforcement learning as a concept, then showing uh, how it can be applied with financial data sets for basically trading different stocks. And then I showed basically, okay, there is a strategy that kind of looks good from the classical point of view, but if you start tracking the robustness, if you start simulate scenarios, if you start to check some financial metrics, it doesn't look good anymore. And a lot of people get tricked by this. So the workshop was about, was about this. Wow, this, that's awesome. And also talking about workshop, I, I remember you also read kind of many books. So for the audience, if you had to pick two or three finance, your favorite finance books, and if you would want to recommend, which would these book would be? Uh, first one is uh, the two books of uh, Marcos Lopez de Prado. Okay, yeah. uh, I, I start with the hard ones. This is this is the hardest. They are yeah. really not not about machine learning. They're about like mathematics, and that's why they're really really good. Uh, the second, by the difficulty, is the book of uh, Igor Halperin, Matthew Dixon, and Paul Bilakon. The book mm -hmm. is called also some machine learning in finance. It's a bit yeah. more about the algorithms, but still it's mathematics heavy. And uh, if this is too hard for you, you should go with the Stefan Janssen book about oh, yeah. uh, machine learning for trading. This is kind of like if you don't know us, you have to begin with that because he's showing you the whole spectrum wide enough so you are aware of all the topics. But if you want something deeper, you need to go like to the other two books I mentioned. So it's like uh, it's like a ladder, I think. Yeah, I think that kind of makes sense. And also one last question. Uh, okay, I'll just take one question from the audience and then I'll ask you another question. Uh, Manisha asks, uh, who are your favorite people in finance, healthcare, and chemical domain? Okay, it's hard to answer this one. Oh, in finance, I just answered. <laughs> Basically, the, yeah. the book authors I mentioned, authors. Uh, they're good. Yeah. The healthcare and chemistry. Actually, the problem is in this field, I still cannot uh, tell you a person because I am... Uh, maybe because I'm not deep enough. Actually, this is actually the good question because it's showing where where is my where I'm lacking some uh, some knowledge. Because, <laughs> for example, I'm following a company Illumina. They do mm -hmm. sequencing, and uh, yeah. they actually they have, they have really good uh, educational materials as well. Uh, I follow a company called In Silico Medicine, and mm -hmm. their CEO Alex Javronkov and uh, they do really, really interesting research. Uh, if you're interested about longevity, I'm following Aubrey de Grey. He is the, one of the most prominent researchers in the longevity area. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
This sounds sort of thorough from the top of my head, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, also, there is, a, there is an interesting Singapore-based startup called Giro, G-E-R-O. I talked mm -hmm. to them on actually on GVT conference, it was in Berlin a couple of years ago, and they made the app that is based on your activity, tells your uh, basically what is your biological age. Uh, it's really oh. interesting how wearable technology can be kind of to longevity. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, this is the, yeah, some examples. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And thanks for answering that. So my last question was very much uh, about you. If people want to reach out to you, where, they, where can they find you, Alex? If they want to ask you questions around finance, uh, which is the best place they can reach out to you? Uh, I think the LinkedIn is like place number one, especially for asking questions. Okay. Uh, uh, second is the Medium. Basically, on my LinkedIn, there is a link to my Medium blog. A lot of questions are already answered there, so you might start, start from there. And I think, uh, profession professionally speaking, that's it. I usually, the short-term small things I post on LinkedIn, discuss on LinkedIn. When I have something like uh, structured uh, and it's open, like open, I share it on my Medium. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think, yeah, minimalism. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sounds good. And uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, it was fun chatting with you, Alex. Uh, you answered some amazing questions. And uh, definitely, I love the session. Thank you very much for this. And uh, I will definitely call you for the 2.0 version. So, okay. Thank you for inviting. It was great talking to you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Take care. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, it was fun. Thank you, Alex.